My name's Gemma. Um, I work up at ECU educating um, uh, first and second year students in a variety of different genetics units. Um, and one of the most complex topics we come across when we do genetic studies is epigenetics. So hopefully today I'll be able to maybe focus the attention on what's really important in epigenetics and what we really do understand at this minute and show you how uh, useful epigenetics will be uh, in the future. <laughs> Um, so epigenetics is a layer of control we have um, on top of the genes. So we've got our DNA sequence and epigenetics forms a layer of control which determines which genes are turned off and which genes are turned on in particular cells in the body. Um, we do this, they do this by making chemical modifications to either the DNA itself or to the proteins that the DNA interacts with um, and making the DNA either accessible or invisible to the uh, transcription machinery. Um, so it's just like sticking a chemical on or off switch on the DNA saying you're going to be turned on, you're going to be turned off, we don't need you. Um, the reason this is important is because every single cell in our body, apart from red blood cells, has exactly the same DNA sequence. So cells in my eye, cells in my skin, cells in my liver, cells in my heart, all contain identical DNA. But obviously the functions of all these cells are different. Um, and epigenetics is the first layer of control which says to perhaps a brain cell, oh, you can shut off all the functions that make insulin, you don't need those. Um, so it helps us develop um, as a human into a large multicellular organism with lots of different cells having particular specificities and particular roles in the body. If we didn't have that epigenetic system turning stuff on and turning stuff off, all the cells in the body might be expressing all the things all the time and it would be absolute chaos. Um, so we need that layer of control to say, right, you're going to be a brain cell, you're going to be a kidney cell, you're going to be a liver cell, switch off everything you don't need and help to develop that function. Um, so in every single cell in our body, we've got two metres of DNA, approximately. So taller than me, an extreme amount skinnier than I am, um, all compacted into the nucleus of every single cell. Um, to help in that compaction, the first thing that we do with DNA is we break them down into chromosomes. So humans have got 46 chromosomes, 23 you inherit from mum and 23 you inherit from dad. And that helps convert that long two metre piece into 46 little shorter pieces. Um, and that's the first level of compaction to try to get the DNA into the cells. Um, so like I said before, <clears throat> uh, every single cell has the same DNA, but every single cell has a completely different function. Um, and the expression patterns of the different genes are different in each particular cell type. So you're going to get um, enzyme secreting cells in your intestinal epithelia to help you break down the food. You're certainly not going to get uh, food breaking down enzymes being released in your smooth muscle cells. It's just not how everything works. Every cell has its own specified function and that specified function is determined by which genes are on and which genes are off. Um, the good thing about the epigenome is that it is changeable. So when things happen and you need to turn on expression of genes which you currently have turned off in cells, you can actually alter that and modify things. Um, this is particularly important during development. So say when the sperm and the egg very, very first get together, you need a lot of stuff expressed at those very early stages of development that you don't need again once you're past, say, three months of gestation. So the fact that we can turn things on and turn things off is really, really important um, and is why the, changeable, uh, the flexibility of the epigenome is really important. Um, so the cells are constantly listening for signals to change what they're doing. So one, um, all the sort of signals we can get are from inside the cell, from neighbouring cells or from the environment. And depending on your stage in development will depend which signals are more important. Um, so when the sperm and the egg first get together and the cells start to divide, then the signals from the neighbouring cells provide the information to say, right, I'm going to be external layers, I'm going to be internal layers, and those internal signals are the ones which start the development. But as you grow older, things in your environment play much more of an influence on your epigenome. So things as... Uh, like your diet, uh, even the season, what diseases you've been exposed to, whether or not you use drugs, whether or not you exercise, all of those things will influence your epigenome and can change the patterns of uh, controls that you have laid down on your genes. 
So it is changeable, it's influenced by a lot of things. Um, and as you get older, the environment is probably the most significant influence on your epigenome. Um, the other important thing about epigenetic signals is that they get um, erased when the sperm and the egg get together. Um, when the sperm and the egg get together, both of them contain the epigenetic signals from their parents. So the egg contains mother's epigenetic signals, the sperm contains the father's epigenetic signals, and when they come together, uh, you need to erase all those signals so that all of the cells that form that new embryo have the possibility to become anything. If they have, if they remain with their um, egg and sperm tags, first of all, you'll get conflicting tags between mums and dads um, chromosomes, but also they've already sort of down a path of development and you wouldn't be able to go back and create all the tissues and organs that you need to in the developing embryo. Um, so when they first get together, the um, methylation or DNA methylation happens really, really rapidly off the sperm DNA. Um, and it goes a little bit more slowly off the egg DNA, but that's purely because you need a couple of those methylation tags to get that cell to, to do those first couple of stages of cell division. Um, but by the time we get to the blastocyst stage where that um, fertilised egg is ready for implantation, all the DNA methylation signals have been wiped and all of the cells in that little blastocyst can become anything whatsoever. So when we talk in scientific research about embryonic stem cells, these are the ones we look at. And these are the ones researchers try to figure out what drives cells down particular pathways so that if you took some of these embryonic stem cells, you could make them into a liver or you could make them into a neuron or you could make them into an eye cell. Um, it's these embryonic stem cells which have the ability to become anything which are so promising in medical research. Um, once the embryo gets to um, recognisable baby shape, uh, all of those DNA methylation tags for tissue specificity are all laid down. So all of the cells in the liver have liver tags, all of the cells in the heart have heart tags, all of the cells in the brain have brain tags. So all of those ones that define tissue specificity and what those tissues are going to um, main be maintained and develop into have all been laid down by the time the embryo is recognisably baby shaped. Um, another thing that's really important with the epigenome is that it remembers. Um, you need to uh, make sure that cells that have started down one path of development don't go backwards. So if your cell's got some signalling from neighbouring cells saying, I'm going to become part of the nervous system, when that cell then divides and creates two new daughter cells, you don't want those daughter cells, one to go, hey, actually, I'm going to be a lung cell, or no, I think I might be a muscle cell. So when the cells go through division, those methylation patterns, those epigenetic changes are maintained, from generation to generation, and then their environmental exposures or the signals they're getting build upon those previous um, exposures. So what we've got here is a stem cell in the embryo. It first gets a signal from its neighbours to say, okay, I've got a couple of cell neighbours around me, I'm going to have to be inside, I'm going to have to be an internal cell, um, gets some signals saying, become nervous system. So when that cell divides, it then passes those signals on to the next cell and that can build upon that. And that cell might get signals saying become spinal cord and then it might get signals saying don't become a glial cell, send out axons. And then in the end, it'll get signals saying become a motor neuron and that's how it builds upon those epigenetic tags from previous cell generations. Um, so epigenetics prevents the cells from going backwards. If we didn't have these epigenetic tags, it would be just like cells expressing things all the time. Everything would be utter chaos and we wouldn't be able to develop this really complex interacting system of tissues and organs that all function together to make us people. Um, so I mentioned before the epigenome is changeable and one of the biggest influences on your epigenome as you get older is your environment. So direct influences such as your diet can affect your epigenome. Um, if you have a healthy di diet, you will have different epigenetic pattern than somebody who has an unhealthy diet. You'll have different genes which are switched on and different genes which are switched off. Um, but your um, epigenome can also be influenced by indirect environmental changes. So things such as the amount of stress in your life, um, when you were growing up, whether or not your parents fought a lot, all of those sorts of things can have an influence on your epigenome. Um, one particularly good example about how nutrition influences the epigenome um, is found in bees. Uh, queen bees and worker bees are genetically identical. They have exactly the same DNA. The only difference is that queen bees are force-fed royal jelly from the minute they're at the larval stage 
and the worker bees are fed on nectar and pollen and water. Um, the fact that the queen bees are fed on royal jelly switches on genes in her that helps her to, to develop ovaries and a really, really large abdomen for laying eggs and gives her a really queenly attitude which sort of get, makes the other worker bees do what, do what she wants, basically. And the only difference between these two types of bees, their DNA is identical, the only difference is the queen bee gets fed royal jelly. So her diet is switching on particular genes to develop her ovaries and her abdomen and they, the um, worker bees remain sterile. So it's, that's all completely epigenetic changes related to diet. Um, so let's go back to how all this works. Um, the way it works starts largely with uh, the DNA winding and the proteins that we use to do that and compact the DNA into the cells. Um, the first level of DNA winding is obviously the helical shape of the DNA. That starts to compact it a bit. Um, but in order to get it right inside the nucleus, uh, we wind the DNA around proteins called histones. Um, now we get eight of these little histone proteins together to form a little ball we'll call it, um, and the DNA winds itself just over one and a half times around each ball uh, to form what's called a nucleosome. And then the nucleosomes wind around one another and they wind around one another and they wind around one another and they compact and compact and compact until they form uh, the condensed or semi-condensed form of chromatin, which you see in normal uh, resting cells. And then when the cells go into cell division and the DNA compacts even further to form those classical chromosome shaped structures that we all recognise. Um, so this is all based on DNA winding around histones and histones winding around one another. Um, so the first type of modification we have are called histone modifications and those take place on the tails of these little histone proteins that form that nucleosome, help form that nucleosome. So each of these histone proteins has a tail that sticks out the side and each of these tails has various points at which you can add different chemical signals. This is where epigenetics gets complex. Um, there are a number of different chemicals you can add to the tails. You can have uh, acetyl groups, you can have phosphate groups, you can have methyl groups, and you can have ubiquinone groups. The position of each of these tags and uh, the position on the tail and whatever is lying next to it greatly influences what these particular chemical tags do. Um, so when we talk about DNA methylation later, um, DNA methylation always turns off DNA expression, gene expression. But when it comes to histones, it's not that clear. You can have uh, methyl groups on particular positions in this arm and this arm, which will actually unwind the DNA and help gene expression. Or if you put them on this arm and that arm over there, it will wind up the DNA and turn off gene expression. So the only really sort of solid thing that we can say is that if histone tails are acetylated, DNA is unwound, exposes the genes uh, to the transcription machinery and increases expression. It gets much more complicated when we're talking about the methyl groups, the ubiquinone groups um, and the phosphate groups. The, the positions of those particular groups and where they are and how they interact with one another can either open or close um, the DNA. And that is a really, really emerging field of epigenetic research, trying to find which combinations will open and which combinations will close. Um, but as an overarching statement, we can say acetylation opens the DNA. So it basically changes the charge um, on the nucleosomes and forces them apart from one another, unwinds the DNA, makes it looser, and uh, uh, allows access to the genes for the transcription machinery in the cell. Um, so it either exposes or hides the genes from the cell. So acetylation opens, some of the other modifications will close, um, and then you have access to the genes or no access to the genes. Um, when the DNA is open, also the nucleosomes can move along the genes or along the DNA stretch, so they don't have to stay exactly where they are. They'll open up and then they'll go, actually, the gene I want still wound around here, or just shuffle down a bit like that. So the histone modifications are ridiculously complex, but if we make the overall statement that acetylation opens the DNA, allows for expression. Um, the second type of modification happens to the genes themselves. Um, and when we talk about genes, these are small sections of the DNA which provide instructions for creating a protein. 
The protein then goes and does its job either in the cell, out of the cell, in another organ, wherever it's sent to go. Um, and the gene itself is made up of three different bits. We've got our RNA coding sequence in the middle here. That's the information that codes for the protein. Um, and at either end, we've got a promoter and a terminator. Basically, as the colours suggest, promoter says this is the start, go from here. The terminator says this is the end, stop here. Um, in addition, promoters have a couple of sequences in them which help to regulate the activation or suppression of genes. Um, there's a number of different sequences where other proteins will bind and either really amp up the expression of the gene or really slow down the expression of the gene. Um, and one particular area of the promoter, um, there is a high number of G and C bases. So it's called a CPG island, where there's lots of Cs and lots of Gs. Um, and in this particular area, uh, methyl groups are able to bind to the cytosine residues. When they bind to the cytosine residues, they basically block transcription. So um, it's like putting a methyl group on the top here. The transcription machinery can now no longer see the gene and no expression happens. So DNA methylation is a lot easier. DNA methylation turns off genes. Easy as. Um, so what we have here is like a little example. We've got cyst cysteine, cytosine residues um, in front of the promoter here. When they're empty, they don't have anything attached to them, we get marvellous gene expression. When they're methylated, the transcription machinery can't actually see that promoter, can't determine the start of the gene, and the gene doesn't get expressed. So uh, genes are switched off when the, the promoters are methylated. Um, so research into epigenetics is quite difficult because of all the influence of the environment. It's really, really hard to say what's influenced one person and what hasn't influenced another person. Um, but a perfectly good uh, study is to look at identical twins. So identical twins are formed when the sperm and the egg get together, they create one embryo and then the embryo splits, creating two genetically identical individuals. So their DNA is all accounted for, it's identical between one twin and the other twin. The only difference that we see then is in their epigen epigenome and the epigenetic patterns that they carry. And these can vary enormous, enormously, even between identical twins. Um, so what we've got here is some chromosome pictures of uh, a particular pair of chromosomes from a set of identical twins. One twin has had their DNA methylation pattern coloured in red. One twin has had their DNA methylation pattern coloured in green. And then the two images have been overlaid. Wherever there's yellow, identical methylation. So at age three, the two identical twins have almost 100% identical epigenome or DNA methylation. There's a couple of areas you see a little bit of red poking through here, a little bit of green poking through here. That might be from something as simple as uh, one baby learning to roll over first, having a different environmental experience like that. One baby perhaps getting a few more nutrients through the placenta. Small little changes like that, but at age three, pretty much identical epigenomes. 47 years later, and the pattern changes remarkably. So again, we've got a pair of 50-year-old identical twins. Uh, we've taken one pair of their chromosomes, coloured one red, coloured one green, overlaid them, and everywhere there's yellow, identical methylation. And here you can see lots more green and lots more red poking through in that overlay. And this is because even though twins are identical, they don't share 100% of their environmental influences. You might have one twin that likes to play soccer and one twin that likes to play netball. And something as little as that can be enough to change the epigenome. Different friendship groups, one twin smokes, one twin prefers to read rather than watch telly. Every single thing that they're exposed to can alter their epigenome and what genes are turned on and what genes are turned off. Um, so identical twins are a fantastic way to determine whether or not there is an environmental um, element to any particular characteristics. Um, and one characteristic we look at here is IQ. So we've got identical twins reared together, so growing up in the same household, um, have an 85% correlation of their IQ. If IQ was purely a genetic uh, determined by genes, it would be a 100% correlation. So the fact that they're not 100% correlated means there's something in the environment that is influencing the IQ of these kids. And we can see if we go down further, 
Um, we've got identical twins reared apart, so in different households, now have just over 70% correlation in the IQ. So there's definitely something happening in the environment which influences the IQ of these kids. Um, and identical twins are fantastic for figuring out all these environmental influences and whether or not environment plays a role in any particular characteristic. Um, so for identical twins, diseases are not always the same between identical twins. You might hear the um, phrases concordant and discordant. So concordant means if one twin has a disease, the other twin also has it. Discordant, one twin has a, the disease and the other twin doesn't have the disease. And discordant twins are fantastic for studying in research because you try to figure out what's different between the twins, why does this one have the disease and why doesn't that one have the disease. Um, so it can be simple things like before, one kid plays sport, the other kid doesn't. One kid might have gone to China and been exposed to high pollution levels, their epigenome's changed and now they have, uh, a more, uh, they have an asthmatic type phenotype, whereas the other kid didn't go to China and they're fine. Um, so looking at the difference in the methylation, DNA methylation pattern and the other, the histone uh, modifications is a very, very emerging field of epigenetic research. Um, and twins are a fantastic resource if we can use them. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is the, um, uh, the forward prospects for things such as epigenetic research. Um, epigenetic therapy is one of the um, promising targets of the future because it seems a lot easier to turn genes on and off than it does to change DNA sequence. Um, and there are actually quite a few drugs that have been approved for human use and, or are under development for altering the methylation patterns of the DNA or trying to adjust um, histone modifications. Um, th the only thing that we need to be aware of is that treatment needs to be selective. So you have to target the exact cells that you're looking for. Um, otherwise, if you turn off a gene in all the cells in the body, well, turning it off in the cells in the lung might be fantastic but turning it off in the kidney or the liver might actually create cancer. So you've got to be really, really selective with the targets and what they're actually aiming for. Um, but epigenetics is a really, really promising and emerging field of medical research and trying to influence the way people develop de disease and manage disease. So that's it for my talk, but I didn't forget this week. Here's my analogy. We have two cells in the human body. This is the mum's coming over for dinner cell. And this is the, I'm having a bunch of friends over for Christmas dinner cell. Both of them have identical recipes or identical DNA. The individual recipes are the genes. And we've got lots of different um, epigenetic modifications which determine which genes are going to be on and which genes are going to be off. So in the mums coming for dinner cell, I have histone modifications here that are cramping up that, those lots of DNA so I can't read them. And mum's going to be getting the chilli, salt and pepper seafood gene expressed for her meal. Histone modifications compacting all that DNA. She's also going to get herb crumbed lamb racks for her meal. But she's not going to get whatever this is because this has been DNA methylated and I can't see what it is. So histone modifications here, compacting all the DNA together. And she's going to get a walnut and ricotta stuffed figs for her dessert. That's our mum's coming for dinner cell. I'm having a bunch of friends over for Christmas cell, has DNA compacted at the start. They're getting pork fillet and pancetta kebabs, but not what this is because that DNA methylation is over that recipe. I can't read it. More histone modifications, chicken and tomato, feta patties with spinach salad, but not whatever that is. DNA methylation won't let me see it. They're getting lime and chili roasted snapper. They're getting tomato mustard and beef with baby fennel. They're getting a BLT salad and they're getting a hazelnut tiramisu, but not whatever that is because that's methylated. Or not whatever that is because that's methylated. And they're getting pears with chopped mint sauce. So even though the histone modifications might allow the DNA to be open and accessible, um, DNA methylation can actually turn off genes in those strips as well. So you might have a stretch of DNA that's unwound. There might be 10 genes in there but you don't need all 10 of them, you might only need six. So DNA methylation will methylate those four that you don't need and you only get the use of six of them. Any questions? <laughs>